Well, I was going to open up with Psalm 19, but the Lord kind of changed the message on me in the last minute, so I think I'll open with Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though the wicked, my enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When thou saidest unto me, seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not the way from your anger. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. I missed a verse there, but when my fa- mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me over not unto the will of my enemies, because false witnesses have risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. I believed to see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. May our eye be single upon you, Lord. That our whole body would be full of light. Father, that you would draw us unto yourself. That you would anoint us for intimacy, face to face intimacy. That we may know, even as we are known. That you may ever be before us, Lord. that you would consume our entire being, Lord. Father, I thank you for simplicity, for a simplicity of walking in your eternal paths. we may step into the eternal realm of you, Father, of you, Jesus. Teach us your way, O Lord. There's another verse I forgot. (laughs) Teach us your way, O Lord, and lead us in a plain path because of mine enemies.
thank you for release of fresh revelation, Lord. Take us deeper. Father, we would be filled with the consciousness of you. I think we'll start in uh, well. I'll have the title here. Normally, I don't have the title because I don't even know what the message is going to be. But uh, face to face, he really just began releasing this to me just a little bit ago. But um, So let's um, let's begin Psalm 16. Psalm 16, one says, "Preserve me, O God." This is David, of course, here speaking. Um, And of course, David says throughout the Psalms, mercy and truth preserve me. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which shall preserve me. So right off the bat, he's speaking of that tabernacle of David being, being hidden in the hands of the Father, mercy and truth covered by the mercy, upgirded by the truth. Which is the throne of heaven. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. And then this verse 2 is, the King James tries to make sense of it, so they add these italicized words. It says, O my soul, just... Toss that out. It's all italicized. It's not in the text. It's simply, Thou hast said unto the Lord, which is Yahweh, Thou hast said unto Yahweh, Thou, my Lord. That art is not in there. Thou hast said unto Yahweh, Thou, my Lord. Thou, my Adonai. Who is David's Adonai? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. So David heard a conversation between the Son and the Father and said that Jesus was speaking to the Father and says, You have said unto Yahweh, You, my Lord Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to the Father, My goodness extendeth is not in the text, Not is not in the text. My goodness is to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent on whom is all my delight. So and we see this goodness right in proximity to preserve me, O God, for mercy and truth because his goodness is found in that place in the hidden place. And as I recite Psalm 27 there, David was pursuing, I believe, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup, the cup of my salvation. Thou maintainest my lot. 
speaking of the inheritance, the lines are fallen, the inheritance lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. That before in the Hebrew is panim. So it's I have set the Lord always before my face. And this is how you see it actually translated in the New Testament. It says he set the Lord always before his face. Because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. David came to a place. He found a place where the Lord, he could set the Lord always before his face. And he says at his right hand. Why does he say it at his right hand? I believe he says at his right hand because at the right hand is the inheritance. And this was David's inheritance to ever behold the Lord before him. And the Lord began bringing me into this today. That we can come to this place. That nothing will take preeminence over that. Of that beholding him. We come to the place where this world. Nothing, no desire can draw us away from that. But he always has preeminence before us and ever beholding him ever having that consciousness awareness before us and David was diligent you see in the Psalms he would ask the father you know to guard his eyes you know that's and his lips his tongue, his thoughts, his emotions. This was the inheritance, ever having the Lord before his face. I have set the Lord always before me, before my face, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. You know, in Psalm 116, it says, The Lord is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. What can man do to me? You know, when we truly come to that place of intimacy, that face-to-face where he's ever there, you know, faith is just going to grow exponentially. Because his goodness is there. His manifest presence is there. And the manifest presence just breeds faith. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth, the King James says. Which is a good translation, but it's, it's literally, if you look at Acts 2.26, actually quotes this and it says, my tongue rejoices. So it gives revelation to what he, David's saying. My tongue rejoiceth. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence, which is panim, in thy face. And here again, this is all quoted here in Acts 2.26 and following. It's, it's, it's translated there in the New Testament, in thy face. Not presence. This is presence there, yes, but the emphasis is on face. 
It's on face-to-face intimacy. In thy face is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, or how does it put it? In the Hebrew, it literally reads, in thy right hand. In the Greek, Septuagint, the Septuagint, of course, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, around 330 B.C., it's the Greek word en, in. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand is pleasures forevermore. Once again, it's not saying to be at the right hand. It's being in the right hand of the Father. In thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Because David is talking about coming into this reality of this secret place. Where his right hand is upgirding and he's covered by the mercy. Not at, not to the right side, but in thy right hand our pleasures forevermore a face to face intimacy You know, Moses had a face-to-face intimacy with the Father. I just want to look at a few of these scriptures. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy. Thirty-four. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 10 says, And there arose not a prophet since Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. There arose not a prophet since Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Turn to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. We'll just begin at verse 1 to get the context here. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken by us also? And the Lord heard. Now the man Moses was very meek. Actually in the Hebrew it's meek meek. So, you know, meek in its perfection, you might say. Very meek, meek, meek. Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So this gives us a pretty good idea of what it is required to come face to face. See, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek. And lowly in heart. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men who were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out and the Lord came down 
in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron, Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Even apparently or plainly. And not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. So when it says he was face to face, didn't mean he could literally see the Father's face, but he could see a similitude. So face to face means intimacy, the closest of intimacy with the Father. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And you know the rest of the story. I won't go there. (laughs) Well, put it this way. Miriam was humbled, wasn't she? I bet she didn't speak against Moses again. Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 11. Well, let's go to verse 10 because we get the pillar here again. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Let's turn to 2 John. I want to give you a little slant here on face to face. 2 John. 2 Epistle of John. Second John, verse 12. There's only one chapter. So, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Where's fullness of joy? In that face to face. See what it's talking about? In his face is fullness of joy. He's talking about that face-to-face intimacy. The most intimate place. And they understood that, as John writes here, that this fullness of joy is in this face-to-face of speaking with you. Now, let's just bring a little clarity. Has has anybody seen the face of God? Let's uh, look at John, of the Father, that is. I know you all know these. John chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father... He hath declared him or seen his face. Moses saw a similitude. It speaks of even Israel and looking up from underneath saw, it says they saw God, but they saw a similitude again. They did not see his face. Verse 
1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 16. Well, verse 15. Which in his times he shall show the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Unapproachable light. And Jesus, of course, dwells in that unapproachable light of the Father. Of course, and and the Father said unto Moses when he said, Show me your glory. What did he say? No man can see me and live. And that word man in the Hebrew is Adam. And so, I believe before the fall, in that glorified state, they could behold him. But in the fall of Adam, no man has seen him. Jesus beheld him. I do not believe that we can behold the Father's face until we are perfected, until we receive a glorified body and there's a perfection. Unapproachable light. So those that are saying... I went into the cloud and saw the Father and beheld His face, you know, all these things. The Word's pretty clear. The Word's pretty clear. So, I don't care what their experience was. We need to know the truth. And not come into that deception. We need to know the scriptures. The scriptures are very clear. Unapproachable light. This is Paul speaking. He was, you know. This is John speaking. And the father speaking to Moses, who he said he had a face-to-face relationship with. So this face-to-face that we're called to, that David was called to, seek ye my face, it's that face-to-face intimacy of knowing him, not actually seeing his physical face, because we have to be transformed into the very image of Christ, and then it's see you, see me, no difference, isn't it? Because Jesus Christ, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, he was the express image of the Father. So as we are transformed from glory to glory to glory and come to that place where we are one truly, then I believe we'll be able to hold his face, but not before then. So if we somehow think that we can behold the Father's face before that time, that's a dangerous thing. But I do believe he wants to bring us to that place. But it's not on this side of perfection. And I don't believe that's too far away. I believe with where the Lord's taking us and the Son's receiving, whoops, glorified body. 21.
Luke 21. Verse 25 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then verse 28, Jesus says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. When you begin to see these things come to pass, look up. To what? To behold me. As David beheld me. As David said in Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before my face. He is at my side. I shall not be moved. Look up. Yes, we can step into this. But we can't take preeminence over the Lord. Nothing can take preeminence over the Lord. We cannot behold anything in this world. What is an evil eye? An evil eye is beholding anything but the Lord before us, before us, that we allow to capture our heart, our emotion, our soul. It's evil. So when Jesus said, let your eye be single, what do you think on him? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's it's giving them any preeminence over the Lord. Where moth and rust do corrupt, corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's what we treasure. Where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye is evil, here's evil. What is it? It's beholding anything but the Lord. Because that is idolatry. We were created only to behold him. And in our fallenness, we came out of that reality. And here, as we're coming to the end of the age, he's going to bring us back into this place. And David was given to us for a witness, a leader and a commander to the people to bring us into the revelation of beholding the Lord ever before our face. I began stepping into this just in the last few hours. And practicing that discipline, even I was driving over here, something that would try and just, and, and there's an anointing for it. David was anointed with holy oil. And you know who I believe carries this anointing? It's the angel of his face. To behold his face. See, where was the angel of his face? 
He was upon the cloud of glory, which is over the four living creatures, which are the four faces of Christ. And he is the one who met Moses at the burning bush. The same one that met Ezekiel. The same one that led Israel through the wilderness. And Moses had a face-to-face with the Father. It's this angel of his presence, the scripture says, but literally it's angel of his panim, his face. Because it's, it's an anointing for intimacy. When I prayed to the Father and I said, send me the angel of your presence, I didn't know really all I was praying. And he sent him to me and when, when Brandon Hess saw it, he said, it's an orange angel of intimacy. It's the anointing of John the beloved to lay your head upon Christ's chest. And then that angel was revealed to me in that dream and I turned to Ezekiel and there it was. The amber, the orange angel as the cloud came in and above the sapphire throne the man who came down and his loins downward were fire and his loins upward were amber. And you know what he did? He took, he took Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 8, he took him in visions. And what did he show him? The seat of the image of jealousy that provoketh to jealousy. What do you think that is? I believe that's a seat in our heart where we behold anything but him and it provokes him to jealousy. What is that place? It's the eternity that he's put in our hearts. That it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. He has set eternity in our heart. And it's this place that the Lord is to put his throne on. He's, He's to be enthroned there and we're only beholding him. And he is enthroned in us when we, when we create that seat for him because he sits upon it in truth. And when we behold the truth, see, he is the truth. So as we behold the truth, as we confess the truth, as that's only what we behold, he comes and sits oh. in that place, in us. In mercy the throne is established, and he shall sit upon it in truth. Not only in the third heaven is he sitting in the Father's right hand in the throne, but the tabernacle of David is bringing us into revelation where the first heaven, which I believe is in us, that's that eternity is set in our hearts. He comes and sits there. See, that's the king of glory shall come in. See what was, but what's before that? Lift up your heads. But lifting up the heads is the eye being single only on him. I will behold thy face always. Before my face always is the Lord. See what is Psalm 24? This is the generation of those that seek him. That seek thy face. We are that generation. And if if we will sanctify ourselves, there is an anointing to ever set him before our face. As he began to (laughs) reveal this to me today, I was just even thinking of the world. I can't behold anything. Nothing in the world can draw me. It's coming to that place, even looking at the beauty of the world, you see through that and see him.
but who will ascend that hill to that place where we can enter into that? We will not lift our soul up into vanity. So what does that mean? We cannot behold anything of this world. We cannot give ourselves to anything of this world. that would provoke him to jealousy, that would take that seat, the image of jealousy that provoketh to jealousy, the seat of the image of jealousy that provoketh to jealousy. And as, father, as it says farther down there in Ezekiel chapter 8, each man in the chambers of his own imagery. And see, it also talked about them, each man with a censer in his hand. See, there's the strange fire. But we're to have the fire of first love. And I believe this anointing brings us back into that fire of first love. And an anointing to ever just behold his face. So whom among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? As it says in Isaiah chapter 33. Actually verse 13, we'll just pick up the beginning there. It says, um, Hear ye if that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. It's talking about judgment coming on the house of God. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? This is what we're talking about. To come see, as he's revealing this to me, I believe, as, as Christ becomes enthroned in us, his glory becomes enthroned in us, we are then coming into the throne, into the third heaven. We are overcoming. To he who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne. See, there's just so many things that are coming, but the whole Isaiah 51, 16 thing, I have put my words in your mouth and I covered you in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens. See, it's his word planting the heavens. And where does Christ sit? On the truth. In mercy the throne is established and he shall sit upon it in truth. So as we... Be he is the truth, and as we begin to come into agreement with the truth, then He can inhabit us, He can sit in us, Amen. in the throne in us, Amen. just as He is sitting in the Father's right hand. Wow. And as we speak that truth, we are creating not only the place for Him, but our place seated with Him. Because what does He inhabit? The truth. The reality in him, the consciousness in him, is contained with the truth. The reality we are in is filled with lies. And so we're outside of this reality, this consciousness, because we're in this matrix that's made up of lies. And we're not consistently coming into agreement with the truth until our words and our confession and our beholding come into alignment with that truth, we can then truly enter into that consciousness. Because he is bound by the truth. He cannot go outside of the truth, can he? He is truth. He can't come into the realm of the lie. And so as long as we live within the framework of the lies and the lie, we can't fully enter into that reality. 
And there's the simplicity of, I will put my words in your mouth and cover you with the shadow of my hand, my mercy. It's speaking that word. And I create the fruit of the lips, Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips. There is an anointing for this. But there's a revelation we have to enter in. It's, it's the revelation of the tabernacle of David. That's why in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. Why? So that the king of glory can come in and so that we can ascend to the throne to sit with him. And there we see Revelation 12, the woman birthing the man-child, and they are caught up to the throne. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. See, there is establishing the seat with the truth. And so, I was going to open with Psalm 19 originally, because... Psalm 19 is all about the word and it's creating of his habitation. And of course, at the end, David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. See, as you begin to come into the revelation and your understanding of why, I'm not just saying this just to... But we must come into the revelation that the Lord must have preeminence. And so I'm just going to say something here as we're stepping into this. As we come into the meetings, let's make sure the Lord has preeminence. If we come in and we're drawing attention to ourselves or distracting from the beholding of the Lord, who has the preeminence? And so this is the honoring of the Lord. To truly come into this place, we have to give him the preeminence that he is ever before our face. And in our lack of revelation, we've done those things. But as we enter into this things, let's 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 honor the Lord. You know what? What if? When the Lord manifests his presence, instead of us acting, what if we were just in silence before him, in just awe of him? And truly gave him the preeminence. As king... As the Lord that paid the price so that we could have this goodness. Yahweh, my goodness is to the saints of the earth and to the excellent in whom is my delight. This manifest presence that abides when we will ever behold the Lord before our face. Oh. And the idols are rent out of our hearts. That's what the scripture speaks about. I will take the idols out of their heart. How is that happening? 
It's the I becoming single. That the whole body may be full of light. And your eye is evil. So what's the evil eye? It's beholding anything but the Lord. So I never did finish uh, (laughs) Isaiah chapter 33 because I was making a point. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and what? And speaketh uprightly. Walketh righteously. See, there's walking in his mercy. And speaketh uprightly. There's the truth. That despises the gain of oppressions, that shakes his hands of holding of bribes. That, what? Stoppeth his ears from hearing of evil, is it? Or hearing of evil? And shutteth his eyes from seeing of blood, or is it the other way around? I always get that one. Stoppeth his ears from hearing blood, blood, and shutteth his So let me ask you this. How do we apply that? Stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing of evil. Can... We, in the revelation of that, can we truly watch the news? No. Can we read the news? No. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to be really practical because I've, I've made this point many times. But this is what we're pressing towards, to ever behold him before our face. Nothing, Nothing. will take preeminence over him. Since when did we have to know the news? See, what is more important, knowing what the devil is doing or knowing our Lord? Isn't that really what's happening? It's taking preeminence over beholding him. Did Jesus say, well, before I pray, I need need you disciples to go out and bring all the news to me. Did he do that? But in the last, it's like, I've been amazed when I preach and people are like, you quit watching TV. What about the news? And I was like, what? (laughs) When did that become this need? A need to know, isn't it? A need to know. But it's a need to know that's filling our need to know for the Lord. And we're filling it with an image of jealousy that provokes to jealousy. Why do we need... This is a... This is a... A recent phenomenon, the news. You know? How long has it been, you know, that you could know everything that's going on in the earth and we somehow think it's... It's a privileged right to know that. Yeah, it's the enemy drawing, hooking us away from beholding the Lord. You know, it's astounding to me, great peop- great men. Who was who the man that Lester Semerall came up to his door? Oh, Smith Wigglesworth. People read these books all the time. Oh, I, you know, I want to walk like Smith Wigglesworth. And they read the book and he wouldn't even allow the newspaper in his house. We ought to like get a clue, you know? Maybe he was ever beholding the Lord. I mean, I've heard the stories. I've never even read any of this stuff, but I've heard people tell the stories where he would just stand there and everybody around him couldn't even stand in the presence anymore. They had to leave because <laughs> the presence was so strong, it's like they were going to die and he would just be standing there for hours. I think he tapped into something.
face-to-face intimacy. Uh, let's just one more scripture here. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, <clears throat> verse 19. This is the making of the tabern or the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And Exodus 25, verse 19. And make one cherub on one end. I know, verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on top on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. There is covering us with his feathers, Psalm 91. Of course, that's a picture of the throne in heaven, the third heaven. Covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony Testimony. that I shall give thee. What do we have together there? Mercy and truth together. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee, and commandment unto the children of Israel. Speaking of, to Moses, says there, he actually spoke to Moses from that place. Well, where is that place where mercy and truth meet together? And of course, that's the revelation That's the key to the tabernacle of David is mercy and truth. So it's for such a time as this. So that Psalm 110, is it verse 3, can be fulfilled. That Yahweh shall send forth the scepter of Christ's strength out of Zion. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. To rule and reign with Christ. But he has to be enthroned in him, and then we have to ascend into the throne of the third heaven. Through the renewing of our mind, And he shall sit upon it in truth. In the tabernacle of David. See, he's sitting in that revelation. In us. Judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Hasting righteousness. That can mean a lot of things, but I believe part of that is the harvest. Because see, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. Then verse 13 it says, And the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. See, there's the coming in of the great harvest. <clears throat> and you'll see this in Revelation and other places, that the birthing of the sons, the huia sons, and the harvest go together. Because what? They're manifesting Christ. 
the world shall see him. So, Father, thank you for kissing us with revelation, Lord. For anointing us with fresh oil. Lord, I ask that your angel of your face would anoint us with intimacy. An intimacy to ever behold your face, Jesus. That we set you always before us, before our face. That you set blinders upon our eyes from the things of this world. That we would not turn to the right hand or to the left. That we would walk in your eternal destiny and the eternal paths of mercy and truth. We would meet together in the way of peace. I thank you, Father. Your word says that in the Psalms that the set time to favor Zion has come. That there is a set time to favor Zion. And we are entering into that time, Lord. I thank you for bringing forth the revelation, for continuing to reveal to us, Lord, that we may have open ears. Oh, Father, that we would not behold things that would provoke you to jealousy. That we would not take preeminence over you, Lord. That you may sit in the seat of our hearts. That your glory would be manifested. that we would lift up our heads to ever behold you, Lord. That our eye would be single, that our whole body would be full of light, that we would know the height, the depth, the breadth, the length, where your hand leads us, your right hand holds us. That we would know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. That we might be filled with all the fullness of you, Father. Now unto you who are able to do exceeding abundantly. Father, I ask it. I think it. I can think it. I can imagine it. According to the power that worketh in us unto you be glory in the saints and the church throughout all ages world without end amen